Well, good evening once again. We're certainly glad that each of you are online tonight with us. I'm glad to have the opportunity to speak to you tonight. If you'd like to follow along, I'm going to be reading from Hebrews chapter 9, verses 13 through 17. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 13 through 17. There it says, For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. What I would like for us to consider tonight is to draw some of the things from this context uh, keeping in mind the context where the writer is discussing the law of Moses and comparing it against the law of Christ and basically pointing out how much better the law of Christ is and showing the blood of Christ being superior to the sacrifices of the Old Testament. But then he points out that Christ is the, the mediator of this New Testament or this new will. This testament or will could only be put into effect by the death of the one who made this will. I think we're all familiar with this concept. We, we typically draft a will, uh, and we have in mind giving our possessions, whether it's money or tractors or a house, or whatever, to our family members, and maybe even our friends. Yet with the testament that's contemplated in our text, Christ is passing along an inheritance to the world. And it's through his will that he has given each and every one of us the power to become heirs, to receive this inheritance, which is what I would like for us to discuss tonight. How that Christians are the heirs of God. First, we need to consider that the Jews of the first century received the opportunity to become the heirs of God. Now, they were already God's chosen people under Old Testament law, but a change of the law was soon to come. And at this time, first century, it, would, it already did come. Galatians chapter 3, verses 24 through 29 reads as follows. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then ye are Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. So this was extended to the Jews. They were given the law of Moses, which was ultimately to lead them to Christ. Unfortunately, the majority of them spurned this opportunity. But then we see that the Gentiles received the same opportunity, the opportunity and power to become heirs of God. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6 reads that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Now, hearkening back to Galatians 3.29, they too would be one in Christ. It says again, if ye be Christ and your Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. In verse 28, showing that a little bit further, there's, there's no difference. Christ makes us equal. Both Jew and Gentile are made one in Christ. And because of this relationship, both of these groups are heirs as promised. We see this reference further in Galatians chapter 4. 
Now, in order to maintain being an heir, one must maintain their faith. They must remain faithful, even if it requires their life. Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 17 says that, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Now one is led of the Spirit by obeying the gospel of Christ. We must put into practice those things we learn from the New Testament gospel. There is no other way to be faithful but then to do his will. Now secondly, what are Christians heirs of? I'd like to consider a few points with this. Christians are heirs of promise. This is a promised thing. I'd like to establish that. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 and through 17 says, For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath of, for confirmation is to them an end of all strife wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the Im immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. Now this passage refers to the promise that was made to Abram in Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 14. We won't read that passage tonight, but it is good to know. Thus Christians are the fulfillment of this promise. We receive the blessings as Abraham's spiritual descendants. So we are the heirs of promise. Next, we are the heirs of the kingdom. James chapter 2 verse 5 reads, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? Brother Guy and Woods in his commentary on the book of James, page 112, has this to say about this particular verse. Quoting, to be an heir of the New Testament usage is to be related to God in such a fashion as properly to receive that which descends from a father-son relationship. This relationship begins with the new birth and such expressions as eternal life, eternal inheritance, or in, and inheritance incorruptible are based on this relationship and they continue and extend the figure thus used to be an heir of the kingdom is therefore to be in that line of descent from God so as to be properly entitled to inherit that which belongs to God which he holds for his children now it must be noted that the kingdom used in this verse is not the entity established on Pentecost of Acts chapter 2. Because keeping in mind, if we are to inherit something, we, ought, we must not be able to possess it at the given time. It's something that is in our future. So the kingdom that one is to inherit through faithful obedience to God must be the eternal kingdom referenced in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 through 28. And at this point, it's talking about when Christ will return the rule to God the Father. He will set aside all his authority that was delegated to him. And so this reference is heaven. Next, we are heirs of the grace of life. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 5 through 7. For after this manner in the old time, the holy, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection unto their own husbands, 
even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as you do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife, as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. The writer here is building upon the ancestry of Abraham and Sarah, who, as faithful members of the church, we are their descendants. This relationship lends itself to the Christian couple being joint heirs together to eternal life. So husbands and wives should be living together, realizing that both of us, husband and wife, are joint heirs of this grace of life. It's not one or the other. It's not neither. It's both. Such a reward awaits all those who are faithful. Next, we are heirs of salvation. This phrase is used with reference to Christians in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. Now, it must be noted that this particular salvation is not the one that is referred to when one is baptized. While we do obtain salvation from our sins at the point of baptism, while we are added to the church by the Lord, this is not the same salvation. Instead, being an heir of salvation, this particular type of salvation refers to the salvation contemplated in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 27 through 28, which reads as follows. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So again, if we are to inherit something, which at this particular moment we're considering salvation, we don't currently possess it, this type of salvation. The salvation talked about here is not the same as the one when one obeys the gospel and obtains salvation from sin. It is one's eternal salvation. When this person becomes a Christian, and remains faithful, they're eligible to receive this eternal salvation. This concept is, is referred to also in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. God is able to make it so that the Christian in heaven can never lose their salvation. They can never lose their inheritance. It is that salvation that we will inherit if we're faithful in this life. God has made it possible for all of mankind to become his heir. Thus, we can, we have the ability to inherit what he has designated, what he has promised in the will of Christ. In order to be considered eligible to receive these blessings, though, one must first obey the gospel of Christ. But the, the battle is not done at that point. Once a Christian one receives countless blessings that are only in Christ, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Yet there are many blessings not yet received, hence the idea of an inheritance, something that is promised to us when we shed this flesh and we step into eternity, hinging all on our faithfulness in, the, in, the, in this life on the earth. These are things which we do not currently possess, but will through faithful obedience to the gospel. We have only considered a few things which are part of the Christian's inheritance, but I hope this study has been beneficial to you, and I hope it will serve an encouragement to remain faithful to God throughout each of our lives. Thank you for your attention.